you have any information about the stories on Missing Reward, call 1-900-860-0860. $2 for the first minute, $1 each additional minute. think maybe I should just quit. On June 8, 1987, Michael Adams was sent home by his boss to change his clothes. He vented his frustrations to his parents. Doing it this way, the guy is just a jerk. You know, Michael came home that day about 1.30, and he says, uh, I'm at my boss again. He says, always uh, treating his employees uh, badly, so the morale in the stories is terrible. He thought he was doing his job well and yet he was singled out at every little thing that he was doing wrong. What are you doing? No, I'm just doodling. Are you OK now? You going back to work? Did you decide to? Yeah, I'm feeling a little bit better. I said just to hang in there and uh, uh, make the best of it. Yeah. So I think you made the right decision. I love you. I love you too. I didn't realize that that was uh, the last advice that I would ever give him. Michael Adams never got a chance to take his father's advice. He never got a chance to study architecture in college. He had just graduated from high school, where he was well known as a drummer in the marching band. But he has yet to take the next step into his adult life, because later that same night, Michael Adams disappeared. Michael had worked at the M Systems food store chain for more than two years. Everybody liked him. He got along with the customers. He got along with all the employees there. He was just a very good kid. One of those that you're real proud of. Though he was well-liked, Michael was somewhat of a loner. At the store, he was closest to the security guard who went on to become chief of police of a nearby town and on several occasions took Michael on patrol with him. But Michael was on his own the night he saw a stranger take supplies from the back room of the store. When Michael approached the manager the next morning and told him about uh, what had happened in the back room the night before, the manager was just uh, real upset at him because he's even back there. He said, you're supposed to be up front, not in the back room. That's not your job. And Michael was just real upset about it. He said he couldn't understand what was going on, so he must have there's something there that he wasn't supposed to see. Two nights before he disappeared, Michael's supervisor recalls that he seemed unusually cautious. After we had done all the chores and everything, we started out the door, and he reached over and grabbed a bat that was leaning up against the side of the store. And I thought to myself at that time, he must be afraid to be out here by himself, but I didn't want to embarrass him, so I didn't, you know, didn't mention it to him. Michael still seemed edgy two nights later. Hey, man, there's these guys out here in the parking lot causing some trouble. I need some help. You know, anytime something broke out, you know, I was always trying to be the first one there, see what's going on. You know, I wasn't trying to be nosy. I just didn't want nobody getting hurt. Yeah, man, they were back over that way. They came walking around. So I went out there and asked them, where were they at? He said, well, I guess they're gone. So I started teasing them. So where are they at now? I don't know, man. But, uh, you I don't swear know. they were out here. Oh, come on, Mike. That night, it was Michael's responsibility to close the store. It was about 11 p.m. when he and Cheeto headed for their cars. Cheeto said Michael followed him most of the way home. They both lived in the same part of town. He pulled up beside me and started revving up his car, and we headed down the road. And we started playing around like bulls racing. Oh, Just about a block before we got to his house, uh, he rolled this window down. And he kind of more or less started laughing. I said, all right, guy, I'll see you later. See you tomorrow at work. And he said, OK. So he turned off, and I just went on. You could see from his street all the way up to the last red light. And there was nothing back there. Michael drove the remaining few blocks to his house. His stepsister, Beverly, woke up when his car pulled in. His lights flashed, then she saw the lights of another car, also flashing as they approached. 
We have received reports that there was a suspicious vehicle hanging around in Michael's neighborhood just prior to him arriving home uh, on June the 8th. Descriptive feature on this particular vehicle would be that it had an electronic short in the headlights, and then as it was going down the road, and the lights, front lights would flicker. I was waiting for Michael to come in, but he didn't come in, so I looked out that window. And Michael was there, leaning against the car door, talking to someone in the car. Beverly didn't recognize the other car. Later, under hypnosis, she would describe it as a late 70s Cutlass or Monte Carlo. Ironically, the car driven by Michael's co-worker, Cheeto, fit the description. Police don't consider him a suspect. Beverly figured it was just one of Michael's friends, so she went back to bed. The next morning, Michael's car was parked in the driveway, but not in its usual spot. He had blocked his stepmother and had disappeared. His, his parents searched his room and found his wallet, which he had probably dropped when he came home to change the day before. There was $180 in his headboard and a paycheck waiting for him at work. It's hard to believe that Michael left everything behind and simply ran away, but investigators have no answers. The case is shrouded in rumors, speculation, and inconsistencies. One discrepancy involves a six-pack of beer which Cheeto claims he saw in Michael's right. car when they were leaving the store that last night. That's all I got. There was a cooler and there was some hot beer in there. I said, no, nah, I don't like hot beer. That's OK. I'll pass you up on that. You know, I didn't even know the guy really drank. You know, I used to tease him about it. You know, let's go get drunk or stuff sure. like that. He always, I got something to do. I said, OK. And then that night, he offered me a beer. I just, I, you know, I didn't even know he drank beer. We found nothing inside the car which would indicate any type of uh, intoxicating beverages, uh, you know, beer, alcohol of any sort. Maybe some other day, yeah. All right, dude. Okay. Right. There's a possibility that he could have taken the beer with him, which would indicate that uh, he left his own free will. Michael's parents doubt whether he ever had the beer to begin with. At school, Michael was known for his anti-drug stance. Some of his classmates thought he was a narc. There was a big drug bust at the high school that he was going to, and uh, some of the uh, kids there thought that Michael might have been involved in tipping off the police or helping them with the drug bust. We just wondered if there's not a possibility that uh, someone was maybe could have took out revenge on him and could have uh, abducted him and got rid of him. Or could Michael have stumbled onto something at the store that he wasn't supposed to see? Michael Adams has been missing for almost four years now. He would be 21 years old, blonde with blue eyes, six feet tall, weighing approximately 145 pounds. A $10,000 reward is offered for his safe return or $5,000 for information leading to his whereabouts. He was just a special boy, and, you know, if he's dead, we want to know if he is. But as long as there's a hope that he's alive, we're going to keep that hope alive in our heart. About two months after Michael disappeared, I had a dream, and he was saying, uh, help me, find me. Michael, if you're out there, I want you to know that we're trying. 